Um, I'm chairing this um, the school improvement bond committee. And um, I guess I'll just read off. And if you can, after you say your name, uh, announce who you'd like to go next. So I'll say Marcus. Hi, everybody. Uh, Marcus Klein with Fortis Construction. I'm working over at the Madison High School Modernization Project. Blaine, go ahead and go next. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, Blaine Grover is sort of <laughs> working with Marcus and the team out there at Madison. I'll say, Dan, you're next. All right. Uh, Dan Young, Chief Operating Officer here at PPS. Um, Roseanne, you want to go next? Roseanne Powell, Board Office Manager. Who would you like to go next? Kara. Hi, Kara Bradshaw, Executive Assistant to the Board. And I will have Emily Courtnidge go next. Hi, I'm Emily Courtnidge, Director of Purchasing and Contracting. And I have um, invited a guest to this meeting, um, one of our advisory committee members, uh, Mark Matthews. So I'll have him go next. I'm sorry, I, I was muted there. Mark <laughs> Matthews, uh, Mark Matthews, Pacific Mark Construction. Good to see you, Mark. And uh, let's see, <laughs> how about you, Julie? Um, who did you want to go next? Julie? Julie? Julia. I can't hear. Is that me? I'm going to take that as me. That's you. Uh, thank you. Julia Brim Edwards, uh, board member. And I um, I got on so I, a little bit later, so I'm not sure who's introduced themselves already or not. So, um, Michelle, do you want to call on somebody? Uh, sure. How about Amy? This is Amy Cronstam, um, board director. Nice to see some faces from out in the field. Sorry, we're sad that we can't come out and inspect your project in person. How about Director Scott? Hi, Andrew Scott, uh, PPS board member. Glad to be here. Uh, how about Aaron Storley? Hi, I'm Erin Storley. I am with Anderson Construction. I'm the pre-construction manager on Benson, and I was the senior project manager on Grant. Uh, Stephanie, oh, uh, Stephanie Thank Coyle. you for doing that. Thanks. Okay. Hi, I'm uh, Stephanie Coyle, and I'm on the Lincoln High School project, uh, project manager for Hoffman Pacific Mark. Uh, let's see, I'm going to call Marina. Marina Cresswell, I'm the Senior Director for the Office of School Modernization. And I will call on uh, Claire. Hi, I'm Claire Hertz, uh, Deputy Superintendent. And I'm going to call on Nathaniel. Uh, I'm Daniel Shu. I'm Student Representative for the Board and a Senior at Jefferson. And I'll call on Jackson. Uh, hi, I'm Jackson, and I'm one of the DSC reps, um, or I'm one of the students on the DSC. Um, Mary, did you want to go next? I'm not sure. Do we have everybody? Has everyone said their name? Mary, did you want to go next? I think she's having audio issues. I also saw, is it, is it, is it Kenan Chapman joined? I just got on. I apologize. I'm not familiar with Google. I was looking for a Zoom invite, but I am here. Excellent. We're um, asking um, just for you to introduce yourself, your name. Oh, Kenan Chapman, Business Development, Anderson Construction. Thank you. Yes, 
Do we have anybody that has not gone? And do we have any public comment today? No. Okay. I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, it looks like, um, David, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm so sorry. I got a call right when it started. Hi, everyone. David Roy, uh, Senior Director of Communications for the District. Thank you, Director DePas. Thank you. Okay, so um, we've done introductions. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Um, we're going to start out with, um, we're going to acknowledge the previous uh, meetings minutes. Um, I'm hoping everybody had a chance to review them. Um, are there any comments? Hearing none and seeing, uh, seeing none, we'll move on to an overview of the business equity program. Okay, well, I'll take it from here and I'm going to do my best to present. So let me see how this works. Hopefully well. Can everyone see my screen okay? Yes, we can, thank you. Okay, okay great. So uh, we've got three main topics today. Uh, the intent of all of them really is to be more conversational. We don't have a lot of data to present. Um, so feel free to ask questions or interrupt or comment uh, as we go along. Uh, first one is business equity uh, as it relates to the bond. So what we thought we would do is just do a real quick overview, uh, look at uh, just a couple pieces of data uh, that might help our conversation. Uh, highlight a couple of current efforts that we're doing as it relates to our business equity goals, uh, then open it up for feedback and discussion. I think that's really the value of this topic is just to have a dialogue and discussion about it. So that is our plan. Um, I was going to introduce everyone, we already did that. So uh, Emily Courtnage and Marina are going to help walk through uh, the few slides that we do have, but we've got a number of contractor friends here as well. So. Uh, they're here to help answer questions uh, if, if we have any. So with that, I think we'll go ahead and jump right in. Uh, Emily, would you mind providing an overview of our business equity policy? Sure. And um, our, our uh, equity and public purchasing and contracting policy was passed by the board in 2012 as we were getting ready for the first uh, school improvement bond in 2012. And it has three components, uh, business equity, which we're going to talk about today. But let me quickly mention the other two components. One of those is workforce equity. And that's about increasing our apprenticeship opportunities on our major construction projects, as well as seeing a, an increase in diversity among uh, the workforce on those projects. Um, we have consistently met or exceeded the 20% apprenticeship goal on all of our bond projects all the way through. So we're excited about that. Um, career learning equity is about requiring our major contractors um, in architecture, engineering, and related services, as well as construction, to be available to offer career learning opportunities to our students. And a lot of our major bond contractors have done some really creative, innovative projects with our students. But today we are talking about business equity, which is about um, where do our construction um, and architecture and engineering dollars go? Um, and specifically, we wanna see uh, more of our construction and a and &E dollars going to businesses owned by people of color, by women, and by small and small emerging small business, um, businesses. So we, um, I think you can go to the next slide perhaps, Dan. So the goal in our, our business equity aspirational goal is that we see 18% of our construction and a and &E dollars going to those Oregon certified businesses. Um, and that's whether they are prime contractors or subcontractors or even third tier contractors. We have a software system called B2G Now um, where that pulls our payments on those contracts directly from our ERP system PeopleSoft. So we know 
exactly which of our dollars go out the door. And then it looks at whether those those firms are certified and it's directly um, integrated with the state certification database. Um, it then asks our contractors to come in and confirm payments to any subcontractors. And then it, it includes an audit process where it reaches out to those subcontractors, asks them to confirm those payments, indicate any second tier subs and so forth. And in that way, we are able to get really accurate data on um, to which businesses our construction and A&E dollars really end up with. Um, and so we, we put uh, B2G in place in 2015 and have been um, tracking very carefully since then. Uh, before 2015, Dan was in charge of manually tracking um, where our bond dollars were going. We do also, as a part of our uh, business equity policy, we are required to report to the board annually, and um, my team does that, and we just submitted a report about a month ago to the board. For, for the business equity part, you might ask, what do we do to try to increase um, our percentage of dollars going to certified businesses? There's certainly an outreach component. Um, there is also a requirement in an administrative directive that one, when we do a small quote process, uh, that the project managers must reach out to certified firms for at least one of the three quotes that they seek to uh, achieve. And, and oftentimes our project managers uh, go to certified firms for more than one of the three quotes. For the bigger dollar projects that we um, solicit by request for proposals, uh, we always include an equity component in the scoring criteria. And so those are some of the ways that we try to achieve our goals. And I think we'll talk a little more about that uh, later in this presentation. Okay. Thank you, Emily. Um, if there are any questions, we'll just keep voting along. We'll certainly have time for questions, but if you have any now, uh, feel free. Uh, we just have a, a couple of slides with data on it. Uh, we thought maybe this one was worthwhile to, to help maybe frame the conversation as uh, it's a simple graph that shows our cumulative bond dollars since we passed the bond in 2012 uh, all the way up through 2020. Uh, and what this shows is, you know, we, we started pretty low, but we've been on a good trend. Over the course of the bond, we have trended in the right direction and we have trended up uh, in our cumulative amount. Uh, this shows our annual percentages over the last four years. So obviously we can see we were trending up in the right direction uh, for those first three years on this bar graph, uh, but had a, a significant drop off last year. So it probably goes without saying like that's, that's the goal here is to reverse that trend, get back to where we were before and, and continue to increase those certified business amounts. I uh, thought we would note just uh, a couple data points. Um, one that you know we'd call a bright spot is our direct appointments. So direct appointment contracts are contracts that we're not required to compete. Uh, the, the PPS project managers can go directly to select one firm, go directly to that one contractor, uh, negotiate a price, and then execute that contract. Uh, it's where staff has the most ability to influence who gets the award because they're selecting who they're going out to. Uh, and over cumulative over the last four years, uh, that's the the direct employment contracts have had a 37% business equity uh, uh, number. So that's a bright spot. Flip side of that coin is our hard bid contracts. These are effectively our low bid, uh, where we're compelled to take the lowest bidder. Staff has the least ability to influence who wins those contract awards. And typically, not always, but uh, we've seen our uh, business equity numbers lower on our hard bids and, and can drag our overall numbers down um, uh, with those type of uh, procurements. Hey, Dan, this is Amy. Can I ask a clarifying question? Sure. So with regard to the directly negotiated contracts, can you um, uh, refresh all of our understanding about which bond funded pro projects are 
um, open to direct negotiation. And I'm not talking about the larger CMGC prime contracts, but of our smaller ones, um, where do we have the flexibility to do that direct negotiation? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, the, the direct appointments, typically it's a dollar threshold and I should know this offhand, but Emily can help me out uh, for either our division for the our, our construction contracts or our professional services contracts. If they're below a certain dollar threshold, regardless of project, uh, that's when we can reach out directly to one firm and negotiate with that one firm. So I'd say most, if not all of our projects are going to have some level of direct appointments, but again, they're, they're smaller dollars. They're, there's more of them in quantity. We're going to have a lot more direct appointments on a given project than any other type of procurement. Uh, they're just going to be smaller dollar amounts. Right. The, um, for uh, a and &E, the direct appointment threshold is 100000 So we can direct appoint up to $100,000. For construction, it's tiny. It's down at $5,000. So, so um, you'll see direct appointment mostly in, um, in those A&E uh, contracts. Um, occasionally, if there's ever an emergency, emergency work, including repair work, we can di direct appoint that. And also the board exempted uh, the uh, middle school work around Tubman and um, I believe it was Rose City Park uh, when, when we were rushing to open those middle schools. So th those were exempt and those were directed by us as well. I have a couple questions as well. Um, thank you. Those are great questions. Um, in the RFP, um, is it possible to share the language around equity, like what we're looking for when we're, what are we asking contractors to provide or, or bidders? And then my other question is on the hard bids, are we tracking the subs that were contacted and versus the subs that are, end up on the job and to, to make sure that they're the same? Oh. I see what you're saying. So I can I can answer the first one about RFP criteria, and it varies from one RFP to the next. Um, although our CMGC RFPs have been fairly consistent, and the, the equity criteria is is and and I can certainly get you some example language from prior solicitations. But it's usually asking um, one, what is your what is your plan to achieve our uh, aspirational equity goal and what can you reasonably achieve and then give us examples of past projects and what what uh, utilization percentage did you achieve um, so it's 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 language like uh, like that and so do we, do we also ask there um, to for the for the bidder to provide a matrix showing their their leadership structure and and who's in leadership positions um, do we are are we asking for that too? So I I believe we have asked um, both for sort of their certification and their um, yes their their uh, workforce equity within their own um, leadership. And again, we need to look at each um, specific solicitation because we've refined this language over time, including with input from auditors and from the EAC. Um, but we have a lot of ways of sort of, of getting at the issue. And then what is the weight that's assigned to that? Is it worth 25% or? It, that varies from solicitation to solicitation and is um, often determined by the project manager and bond leadership. And so um, for a specific project, I could not tell you off the top of my head what has been included in the past. Okay. I can say that one of the things that we're currently reviewing is whether there should be a minimum percentage for the equity criteria of the RFPs that we simply have across the board um, within OSM when we put out an RFP. So we're looking at things like that. We're also looking at the makeup of the criteria and really trying to hone in on the types of things that are going to be indicative of a um, successful um, percentage of certified business participation. Um, we're definitely taking a much closer look at that um, given the, the data that we're seeing this year. 
And then I don't know that I heard an answer. Did, uh, um, so when uh, the lowest responsive bidder, um, do we, is anybody checking to see that the subcontractors that they got bids from are used on the job? You know, to so, verify that if they're, if they, if they win a contract and they're, because they're the lowest cost right. responsive, do we know that if they go to a, ABC electric for a, for a, for a bid that ABC Electric is used on the job? So our lowest bidders, I mean, are, do have to submit uh, their first tier contractor form um, within a couple hours after bidding. And so we have those listed and there are some rules that if they want to switch a, a subcontractor, they have to notify us. We have been notified, I can think once or twice in the past when that has happened um but i'm not aware of it happening frequently and I, I think i think we know from the field that those substitutions have occurred more than has been obvious and evident to us because i think it's fair to assume that that is one of the factors for this um you know this decline that we've seen in the last year yeah, so my question was about, you know, I, I understand there's a process in place to be notified if the sub is switched out, but is there any enforcement in between bidding time and job time? And and so I was curious about what, what we were doing to in, enforce that or encourage uh, good behavior. Mm -hmm. So again, I've, I can only think of one time when I've been notified, which they are required to notify us, but I can think of only one time when that's come to my attention. Um, so I'm not sure. I don't know if Marina or Dan ha are more aware of that. No, I, I mean, we're definitely checking to see if they have enlisted as a first tier sub, um, then we anticipate that those are gonna be the subs that we're seeing come through. Um, in the field as well. And so that is a conversation that, that will occur if they are swapping out. What I'll say though, is that the, the biggest impact on our um, cumulative rates are the CMGC projects. Because right now, our modernizations are primarily CMGC projects. Mm -hmm. um, certainly uh, Kellogg, middle school project is a low bid project. That one does have an impact because of the dollar amount for the project, but it's not even as big an impact as the CMGCs are. So in some ways it's it's relevant. It's definitely something that we're looking at, but I don't know that it is, I don't know that looking at that for low bid is going to uh, really identify the issue um, that, that we're facing. Marina, I like I like sort of the way that you're framing that, but can you just take it to the next level, which is um, what kind of, if not leverage, opportunities for encouragement and or um, explication of our institutional values is there um, in those CMGC relationships i mean obviously we don't know the subs that they come forward with on their bids are their subs i, I don't know the extent of the what's being swapped out but how, how can we communicate we don't have actual leverage we don't have enforcement these these goals are aspirational how can we as an owner make it more clear to the marketplace and, and prospective bidders how important these values are to us? You know, I think those are really great questions that we're, we're all sort of grappling with right now. And, and so I, I wanna clarify, first of all, that CMGC doesn't, um, when we bring on a CMGC contractor, um, they're not necessarily coming on with a bunch of subs. Right, that this is there's a process of bringing subs on board. It extends mm -hmm. throughout the pre-construction phase to some degree or another. There's typically trade partners during pre-construction, 
and then there's a buyout of um, construction, you know, packages of work as part of the construction phase. So um, it's a little bit different discussion um, than the low bid projects. Um, but I think that the question you're really coming at is not so much the, 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 the details of how they bring on subs or take off subs, it's really how do we engage to, um, to really indoctrinate them in what is important to us, right? right. How, do we, how do we share with them these things that are critically important? And I, um, I feel like we've, we do a lot um, to that end. And I think that's probably a little bit of the, the ongoing presentation here. You know, it's just a little bit of discussion of the types of things that, that we're doing and that we're encouraging our, um, our general contractors to do. Um, I, but I also think that there's, there's more we can always look at. And so we've got some ideas that we've been thinking through. I anticipate we're gonna continue having additional discussions, both you know, with the board and with the, with the BAC, with the Obama Accountability Committee, as we try to figure out some new things to try to improve. I, um, Deanne, if you don't mind, I think we were gonna go and just kind of talk through a couple things on the presentation that might give a little more background um, and kind of frame it for additional discussion. Uh, yes, I think that's actually a very good segue um, to this uh, this section here. Um, we thought it was worthwhile to just point out some of the efforts um, that go into promoting our business equity goals. Uh, Emily's going to talk about the advisory committee here in just a minute, um, but I think Rena. Uh, if you wanted to highlight a couple of things that OSM does uh, or our contractor partners, or if you want to have one of the contractor partner friends uh, highlight a couple of things, I think that'd be worthwhile. Yes, and um, I think, as you said, we'll we'll uh, we'll talk through the OSM and the contractor items first, and then um, hand it over to Emily um, for purchasing and contracting. But within OSM, I think as we've mentioned. Um, with RFPs, we have criteria for equity that can help us um, try to provide greater importance to, to um, bringing on certified businesses. We do direct appointments where we can. Um, we also work with the BAC, and in fact, we anticipate working um, more extensively with the BAC regarding business equity um, this year both for the upcoming Benson GMP, but also for potential 2020 bond projects if the measure passes next week. We have also requested our performance auditors this year in what's called year three of the performance audit. We've requested that they look at business equity and what it is that um, PPS and OSM is doing to support business equity. We want them to look at what we've done in the past. Um, typically, as part of looking at what they, we've done in the past, they will also look at what other jurisdictions are doing. And they'll provide that kind of feedback to us as well as they make their recommendations for what we could do in the future. So um, we, are, we very specifically asked them to make it a large part of the um, work plan for this year. And so that is something they've already started um, doing their field work on. Marina, where, when will we get some information back from the performance auditors on that? Um, their report will be coming out because it is part of the annual report. It will come out in probably June is when we should see the report. Um, as you know, the timing can be difficult to present that report to the board um, just because we head into the summer and the meetings get a little challenging but we will try to get it to you as quickly as possible. And of course, you know, understand that while we may not necessarily um, have their report available to present to you until June, in the meantime, while they're doing all of their field work, they're talking with us too. And so this is one of the benefits of the performance audit for us is that they're, they're talking through the things that they're seeing in real time. And in real time, we're trying to figure out 
hey, should we be doing something different? What could we be doing? So it's not a static process where we just sit around and sort of wait for them to, you know, to look at everything and then come back with a report. Um, this has been really part of the greatest part of, of the audits is that we have such a, a good back and forth discussion about the things that they're finding. And it's giving us opportunities to really focus on them um, while they're doing their field work. Um, yes. Well, I had another question. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to dive a little deeper on what you said about the BAC and looking to engage them more on this question, because I know that this year they didn't really hear about our um, significant decline um, in, in um, minority contracting, for lack of a more complicated acronym, um, until after after it was too late, you know, after uh, subs were all were for the most part allotted and all that, um, they didn't they didn't have a heads up. So so what are what are we thinking in terms of engaging them earlier and having ways to course correct um, on this issue? So what we are planning, we actually um, unfortunately had to reschedule our BAC meeting that was supposed to be last night. Um, otherwise we would have had it by now, but one of the things that's uh, scheduled for this BAC meeting is a presentation of the proposed uh, procurement plan for the Benson project. So the Anderson team here, some of the folks that are here on this call, will be presenting uh, their proposal on how they're going to procure subcontractors and how they're going to meet the business equity aspirational goal. And we have allotted a significant amount of time for discussion with the BAC afterwards. Um, in large part because we want to pick their brains and see not only how they feel about what's proposed, but also any additional ideas they may have. So that will be coming up at the next BAC meeting, which we're in the process of scheduling right now, so I won't give you a date just yet. Soon. Um, I have some comments on the just what we're looking at, the purchasing mm -hmm. and contracting, and Awami is mentioned here. And I'm wondering if we are also talking to the Oregon Native American Chamber of Commerce, um, the, all the minority chambers of commerce, um, and the NAMCOs and the, I can't, the name is escaping me now, but um, is it P, PBG? Yeah. So we, we uh, advertise those other community partners to increase. I mean, I know PPS used to be very active at these events. Um, and I know that, you know, staffing has made it, it's, it's spread out now amongst many staff. And, um, but I'm wondering if we're, are we sending people to these places where they can try to increase the participation? So we, do on occasion go to Oami when we have new um, upcoming projects and announce those. And we um, certainly advertise them um, and go to the trade shows and have tried the open houses, um, including joint open houses with a couple other agencies. Um, I, I think it's actually more productive for our, for our CMGC partners to go to those open houses when they are about to put out um yeah bid packages on the street because my team in the cmgc world my team's involved in the initial initial solicitation of the cmgc partner um and that's not when the bid packages are going out that's that happens far down the road at which point that is run by our cmgc partners so um, I think Marina can talk a little bit about that, but we know that a lot of our partners are out there at those organizations actively speaking about the big pack, uh, packages that are coming up. Is that, um, so is that requirement that they attend these networking opportunities, is that also included in the business, in the language, the RFP language? That, it, that, that expectation that they would, you know, regularly engage with to build relationships with so it is not required 
in the RFP language, but it has been um, a absolutely huge part of every single one of their plan, plans that they presented to meet our expectations. So to, just to follow up on that, they're required to provide their procurement plan to us. And we have to approve the procurement plan. The procurement plan does lay out the types of outreach that they're going to engage in, um, the participation in these types of trade shows and open houses and WAMI and um, all of the others. And in fact, um, just to tell you a little bit about what the contractors do. I want to note um, we provided some slides from a presentation that Fortis did to the BAC in July regarding their certified business um, participation and the efforts that they made and sort of what came out of that. Um, we shared those. You, you had seen them previously, but we've provided them again for this meeting. Um, and I just want to note that um, Marcus Klein and Blaine Grover from Fortis are here. And, and able to answer questions about those slides and the efforts that they made, if you have questions about that. Um, other things that our contractors do is they engage in partnerships and joint ventures. Mm -hmm. um, we, in particular, here today, we have um, Anderson Construction, um, Aaron, of course, who uh, was introduced, um, Brad Nile, um, they can both talk about joint venture in regards to Grant High School. Um, Hoffman and um, Pacific Mark are uh, engaged in a similar type of um, venture. And we have Stephanie Coyle here today from Hoffman who can answer questions as well. Uh, and. I'm going to miss folks here on the call, but Mark Matthews is here on behalf of uh, the Equity and Contracting Advisory Committee, but he is also, of course, um, Pacific Mark as well. And so a couple other things that they do within the contractor side of things, um, they look very closely at their bid packages. That could mean that they are looking at providing um, smaller bid packages so that they can get out to smaller firms that may not have the bonding capacity yet to do a bigger um, set of work. Uh, that allows them to help grow some of the smaller certified businesses. They also do targeted big packages. Um, targeted can be both um, uh, from a best value selection, meaning that they are doing an RFP type selection where they're providing um, points for certified business participation in the package. Um, it can mean that they are targeting certified businesses specifically for that work. And um, they can also do RFPs. One of the other things that our, most of our general contractors are doing, I mean, pretty extensively and have been for a while, is they're doing mentorship and education. So they are um, mentoring some of these smaller firms um, whether it's a general contractor firm that they're doing a joint um, venture with or it's subcontractors that they're bringing on board. They're doing a significant amount of mentorship and education. And um, I specifically asked um, Stephanie Coyle from Hoffman to be here tonight in case you had questions about that because um, Hoffman does quite a bit of it and Stephanie is able to speak really knowledgeably about the work that they do um, in case you have those kinds of questions. Uh, and I think I did not, I missed uh, mentioning um, Kanan, who is here with Anderson, who can talk a little bit specifically about the types of outreach um, that they're doing as they prepare for the Benson GMP and the procurement plan that's coming up with Benson. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, I'd, love to, I'd love to hear about that from, um, Anderson, specifically about Benson. Kanan, nice to meet you. Um, I know you guys, uh, you guys are, I know you're not in a joint venture with Colas on this job. Um, it's, you don't have a partner, right? It's not a joint venture. It's just Anderson as the prime. Yes. Yeah, I'd love, I would love to hear a little bit about some of that procurement. And then I'd also just love to hear from our contractors while we have you on this, our, our, our main 
prime contractor for these big modernization projects. You work with a lot of entities in our region, public and private. And I'd like to hear a little bit about um, how we are as an owner on this issue of business equity and um, what we do well, what, what innovative practices others have that we have not yet adopted, or just share a little bit about your relative experience. That's that's fantastic. I'm interested in 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 all of that as well. Okay, is that me, Ed? You want me to go ahead, or you or Brad going to start off? Yes, sir. All right. Um, again, Cannon Chapman <laughs> Business. I just hope that this is a safe space to you know, um, to share your learning and to share your feedback on where we can do better. It's not a judgment. It's a li literally a way for us to. You know, show up in this space as as good community, um, you know, partners. Absolutely, um, and I would say of all the people that are on this call, I would probably be the least judgmental person, as I might have maybe two years of construction experience. Um, I am from Portland. I do know business. Uh, more importantly, I do know people, and so um, with some of our efforts that we've initiated in the process of Benson. Some of the things that we identify, first of all, I would say would be some of the struggles we might have had with grant. So we learned from that process and ways to actually get better. Um, even though we had success at grant, I think we wound up finishing with about a little bit over 22% uh, MWESB participation. Uh, we always wanna to strive to get better in that. And there were some gaps that happened between that process. And we want to make sure that we identified those, even though working with COLIS on grant um, didn't necessarily ensure that we would get the support uh, and meet the goals. It gave us an opportunity to get familiar with each other so we could create that momentum going into the Benson project. But with that, uh, one thing that we wanted to identify were the stakeholders within the community that we absolutely wanted to get with to identify who would be some of the key subs that might be able to take on a project to this magnitude. So to your point, uh, we consistently not only went to the OAMI or continue to go, I don't want to talk in past tense because this is something that's ongoing, but in terms of OAMI, in terms of NAMAC, uh, PBDG in particularly, and the leadership of those three entities, we have spent ample time not only attending those meetings, talking to the memberships of those particular groups, but actually spending an abundance of time with the leadership with those groups to really be honest in identifying who can actually take on these scopes of work. Um, because it's not really to award scopes of work, it's to make sure that everyone's successful in the process. And so um, being able to have candid conversations with uh, the leadership within these entities has been very beneficial. I think I've been able to play a, a pretty key part because even though I'm new to construction, I'm not new to Portland. So there's some existing relationships with Nate McCoy, uh, Faye Birch. These are people that I've known since early childhood that um, have been mentors to me and have actually offered direction uh, in terms of guiding me through some of this process, which has kind of lent uh, a second arm, I guess, around Anderson and kind of bridging that gap in terms of us making correct decisions. Uh, one thing that we have done internally in terms of Anderson is we've just kind of been a little bit more intentional and deliberate about our approach. It's one thing to want to be a little bit more diverse and inclusional, but being able to uh, commit the time that it, that it takes to you know, actually bring these subs up to speed and to work with them to get through some of these projects. Even though we're in the pre-construction process with Benson right now, we've been spending a lot of time just walking through scopes, um, working on our process of presenting to BAC and to PPS to um, hopefully get approval and right sizing and maybe sole sourcing some things and doing some other things to make sure that we can put people in a position to not only get the work but to be successful in the process and that's been a collaborative effort between the leadership of these organizations and the people who are in direct leadership of these projects um, one thing that we're dealing with uh, currently is the fact that 
just kind of understanding the climate. With these subs, even though we, our goal is to garner a relationship uh, with these subs, they're not necessarily at a, a comfort level with a GC of our magnitude because and they look more at Anderson, I can only speak for us, as an opportunity more so than a relationship. So with an opportunity, you don't necessarily want to cut your nose off to spite your face. So some things that you may not be as strong at, you may not be as open to kind of express the help that you may need or the support that you may need. So we've been dependent upon the leadership, specifically with uh, NAMAC and PBDG, Faye Birch and Nate McCoy to be specific, in terms of them being involved and joining us in our calls and our meetings. So there's a inner support circle directly with the subs that they feel a little bit more confident. And then there's also a level of accountability that comes along with that. And then us being on the outer circle in terms of making sure that everything is running the way that we need it to run. So when we do make our proposals to the people would be, whether it's BAC or PPS, we're all in the same place because what we don't want to do is propose something. You guys actually grant it to us and then we still drop the ball. That's not good for anyone. So making sure that we do have their inner circle in the same room, um, hearing the same conversations that we're hearing and then actually laying out a game plan to figure out what it is that we can do. So if we had a million dollar scope that we wanted to give someone from roofing, but they're only ready for our 250,000. The reality is that that's more work for our office, but the reality is that that's work that needs to be done if we wanna be inclusion and we wanna create a more equitable platform moving forward. So I would say that's some of the initial things that we've done and it will be an ongoing process, but we do have the support of the community, uh, the leadership in the community and some of these subs as well to just make sure that we get people in the the right position for everybody to be successful in the process. But Mr. Um, what you're referring to with NEMAC, that's actually a professional service that they provide, right? Like you have uh, contracted with them to give you that expertise in that process, which is also something we could do as well. No, we haven't. And Aaron, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think that we're a, a, a sponsor, which means we support their activities and their programs and we support their efforts, but we're not contracting with them to help us through this process. What they're looking for is opportunities for their membership to be able to get these significant scopes of work in order to you right. know, be part of these projects. But we're not actually hiring them to help us make this happen. It's actually a pre-existing relationship that we've tried to grow where it's more hands-on and Basically, it's not a consulting type of situation. We need them to be inclusional in what they're doing just so there's a level of accountability where it just doesn't look like we're big brother pointing the finger down. We're all together trying to grow everyone up. Yeah. But they, that, and that's helpful. But they do offer that, I think, as a professional service. They yeah, do. Sure. They do. Yeah, they do. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention is you may also have noticed that in recent times, your projects are getting bigger, which makes it hot. big projects can make it more difficult to get small contractors involved because you have to slice off a piece that, that fits with that contractor. It's more not at telling them what or telling the community what we need. We need a big contractor that could come pull down the entire roofing scope to get the percentages that are in the prime agreement, the 18%, the aspirational goal. Uh, but what we're finding is they're just, we're talking about growing businesses here. So another mind shift would be think about opportunities. Are we thinking about the overall dollar volume or can we increase opportunity? Mm -hmm. And so one of the ways that we looked at that on Benson, um, that we're really looking forward to is uh, if, if we would have had to public bid everything in a low bid, we could guarantee no opportunities. It would all be straight low bid. You have to be the lowest number. If you don't have the buying power of a large corporation, you're already at a disadvantage because you can't buy the materials in bulk. You're not shopping at Costco, right? Um, so we said, all right, well, let's, let's go a step further there. Can we, um, and I'm glad to see that PPS seems to be opening some um, 
different ways of thinking that other public organizations are um, considering um, or have already implemented. And also I see the organization just in going from Grant to Benson, I see some doors opening, which is exciting to us because it gives us the ability to get that work into the um, minority contractors' hands. So one concept is the set-aside package that says we're still going to have competition. It could be low bid, it could be qualifications or value-based, but we're only going to bid this to minority contractors. That gives them a safer zone and a more even playing, playing field. Still, with that scenario, you want three bids. You may not be able to get three bids um, in let's say plaster repair or something like that. There may be only one plaster company. So what we're asking, and under Benson's scenario, we would have had 11 set-aside packages. We were able to double that number to 22 by saying, what if we direct contracted? You tell us you're interested, you prove to us what, you, what your capacity is, and we will figure out a way or ask a way that we can verify that we're getting fair market pricing because we have to be good to the, the community that supported the bond. They can't think that they're, that this is just whatever price you want. So we're, what we've asked for in our contracting plan um, and we're waiting for feedback is if we get a third party um, estimator to verify that this is market pricing, then can we go ahead and, and uh, direct contract? So, Again, we went from no uh, just hard bid, low dollar, that would be zero guaranteed opportunities. If we did set aside packages, we think that's 11 package opportunities. And if we were able to negotiate um, with some bidders that we think are highly qualified and very interested in the project, that would be an additional 11, up to 22. Thank you very much for that. I'm going to move us along um, in the interest of time. Um, obviously, this is a um, topic that, you know, there's a lot of questions out there. I know I would appreciate, sounds like some other people here might appreciate regular updates. Um, and the other thing I would just ask is if we could disaggregate um, our MWESB data, because I think we know, you know, every, Every public agency in town um, has most of their dollars going to emerging small businesses and um, and less dollars going to minority owned and women owned. So if we could disaggregate that data so we know exactly, you know, where those dollars are going rather than lumping them together, I think it would be helpful for me in any case um, to understand. But let's, let's move on to our um, next topic, even though I think we could talk about this for a long time. And that would be um, our 2020 bond execution plan overview. Um, I'm not sure who's Wait, presenting so, that. Can I just um, say one thing to close out this conversation? Sure. Thanks. Sorry. Um, first of all, thank you very much to our, our contractor friends for joining us for this conversation. Um, speaking for myself from the board perspective, um, this is a really critical issue for us right now. Um, our numbers um, for this year are uh, half what they were last year for our minority contracting and they're half on our bond work and they're about half of what our aspirational goal is, which to me is um, really a crisis. And it's really something that we need to figure out how to be the owner of choice for our minority and emerging small business contractors in this community. So um, I think we are starting to give a lot of attention to it, but any feedback that you all can provide us in whatever channel I think are helpful about how we can be a better owner in this regard um would be would be really welcome um and yeah that's all i wanted to say but i wanted to put a fine point on it that that these are these numbers are um really precipitously much lower than they have been and i don't know if the benson gm gmp is um going to be negotiated by the end of this fiscal year marina uh by the end of this fiscal year yes so we'll get it, it in will. but again numbers the numbers Anderson is doing are going to get in on our 1920 numbers here the numbers are based on invoices paid okay all right well so, then we're gonna have to move forward after uh 1920 but anyway thank you all for for sharing your perspectives thanks michelle 
And thank you. Yeah, it's um, it's something that I hear um, a lot when I'm out in the community talking about this potential bond and, and there's a concern there that um, our numbers are low. So um, why don't we move on though? Thank you everybody for your um, attention and innovation and great thinking and questions. Um, we, we're going to get a bond a bond execution plan overview now. I'm not sure who's um, delivering that. Is that you, Dan? That is me um, with Marina. So, um, and so one, uh, I'll just say a quick thank you for everyone for sure on being here. Uh, we wanted to have a good discussion, so there's a lot of value there for everyone. Uh, so appreciate that. Uh, the bond execution plan. I think this topic will will be fairly quick, um, but. Uh, first, lots of questions. We'll answer those questions. Uh, the reason that we wanted to bring this topic forward was, you know, we we sort of envisioned a scenario where a week from now, if we're in the position where we had passed another bond, we thought committee members might naturally ask, well, "What are we doing now? What are next steps?" So we just want to give a, a little bit of insight into what those next steps look like, um, and specifically a deliverable that's that staff is putting together and that the committee will see is the bond execution plan. Uh, so the bond execution plan in, in short version is really uh, some more details around how the district will complete the work. Uh, scope, schedule, uh, budget, of course, financial constraints. Uh, down you can see some bullet points of uh, what the outline that we have in place now, procurement strategies, stakeholder engagement, and you know, all these components um, will go into this bond execution plan. Uh, and, and it gives visibility into the intentionality around how we're going to manage it and how we're going to complete the work. So we have a draft uh, of it now. Uh, we're continuing to work on it and work with, and there's lots of different people who work on it. It's certainly not just uh, OSM that puts this together. Uh, but the intention is to come back uh, at the committee meeting in December and, and have a discussion about the plan then. So we just wanted uh, the committee members here to know that if the bond does pass next week, that there is work that's going forward and there's going to be this, uh, a more robust discussion around these different components of completing the work. Now, one piece of the plan that we thought that we would point out is each scope of the work that's in the bond is going to have its own, we'll, we'll call it a high level schedule. Every scope of work is going to be carried out differently. And what we will do is, is provide some more information around that sequencing of events. Every scope of work is going to have some version of assessment, engagement, and prioritization uh, at the front end, uh, then planning and design and permitting, and then implementation. What I think is worthwhile to point out is um, that assessment and engagement, that prioritization, what that phase does is gives uh, all of us more detail around what exactly are you going to do with, with these funds. And so after that initial phase is when we come back to this committee and provide more detail about those, those specific scopes of work. Uh, also what happens, maybe you can't see because of this thing here, uh, at the bottom of this little graph, we just put on mechanical as an example of scope of work is this initial work. So it's going to take us time. We've got lots of information uh, about our mechanical systems, about how poorly many of them function. Uh, we don't have a bunch of detail on how best to address a lot of them. So it's going to, that assessment and that prioritization is going to take some time. In the meantime, there's going to be needs for us to expend those funds, those mechanical funds. If we have a boiler uh, at the beginning of the year that needs to be replaced, we're going to replace that boiler and that's going to be an appropriate use of those funds. So that's what we call initial work. Uh, and you know we will make sure to do a good job of keeping this committee and others updated what those that kind of initial low hanging fruit, if you will, work that that needs to happen. Um, but we want wanted to let you know that this detail of a schedule is coming forward for every one of these scope of work, so you'll be able to understand. Oh, I can see this sequence of events because as the bond passes, it's going to take time to do the assessment. It's going to take time for us to set up the financial systems uh, to hire staff to complete the work. So a lot of work will be happening. It's just not always the visible work that happens right away. So that, so the intent of this topic was to just give some context and some visibility into that work before you actually start to see some of these work products. I think that's it. So any any questions on that? Or Marie, maybe I'll stop and ask Marina what I forgot because I'm sure I forgot some good stuff in there. 
I don't think you forgot anything, but I think it's really just to say that there's a, um, a lot of work that's occurring in the background. And, um, you know, if the bond does pass next week, while we're not going to be stepping out and spending money on projects the next day, we certainly have been putting together a plan and we'll be talking through that plan with you um, at the next bond committee. And that plan is really intended to, to give you the framework of how we implement. Um, it's not just a continuation of the bonds that we have done in 2012 and 2017, because we have some unique components to it with technology and curriculum in particular. And so we're, we're really looking very closely at how we ensure that all of these things are done um, consistently with transparency, with accountability, and um, within all of the, the sort of rules and laws that we need to follow. So it should have a significant amount of detail and, and it'll also kind of give you the roadmap for how we will be moving forward um, to execute that bond. Thank you. I thought the visual was really helpful. Um, so in other words, if somebody says, what are you doing? You can say, well, there's all this pre-work, this assessment piece, the engagement piece, you know, for people that are maybe um, familiar with the development cycle. So thank you for that. And I guess that brings us to our last topic, which is- um, oh, can I ask a question? oh, sorry. Go ahead, Andrew. And then I have a question. No, it's just a really quick question. Will we be, um, will the district be amending its CIP sometime this fiscal year if the bond passes? Yes, okay. they're working on that. We're working in conjunction with the capital improvement plan. We're also working in conjunction with the efforts around the long range facility plan. So we are trying to coordinate all of those different components together as we're moving forward. Okay, great. No, I, I appreciate this, this piece and, and the work that's going on behind the scenes. And I think it'll be really useful for the community as well for us to lay out the the, the implementation plan that you're putting together and, and really show people, you know, here's the here's the, the multi-year spending plan of this, you know, very large investment. And and, and then we can hold ourselves accountable to, to, to meeting mm -hmm. those timelines as well. So mm -hmm. appreciate that. Thanks. Also, yeah. what is what I mean for the long range facilities plan when we're able to take some of those most urgent um, items that otherwise might have come out of the general fund and include them in our bond funded work. Um, my question, Marina, on your last point was um, where you're talking about structures to put in place for um, in the event that we are about to take on that much more work is I'd like to hear more and have conversation in this committee about our um, our structure for construction management. Um, I know we've made some changes lately. There have been a couple of those contracts that have come to the board um, broken down, but I'd like to learn more about um, to what extent are we looking to develop our own internal capacity? Um, to what extent are we going to continue to rely on an external consulting model? Um, how are we making those decisions? How are we breaking up those contracts? Um, that's something that um, I, I, I'm interested in and I don't have a lot of information about. Are you looking to have that discussion right now or at a, at a future meeting? Um, it, it did not get put on the agenda for this meeting, so it can wait till the next time so we can have it for both um, what, what are we doing in the present and for the 2017 mm -hmm. bond that's a little different than the past and then how might we envision it um, for the future too. Sure. Happy to have that discussion at the next meeting. Great, so we'll make sure that that uh, makes it to the agenda. Uh, Madam there... Chair? Yes? Madam Chair, can I ask a quick question? Yes, I was just gonna ask if there were any more questions. Um, please go okay. ahead. Um, thank you. Um, I th actually, I wanna just share um, something with staff and then um, ask a question that uh, I, being asked frequently, just um, given my role with the bond, is that given the breadth um, of the types of projects that we're doing, whether it's the accessibility, the uh, curriculum materials, the IT, um, there is uh, questions from community members about, and staff and just stakeholders um, about um, engagement in the process. Um, whether it's the accessibility or ADA improvements about getting somebody with uh, universal design, design knowledge or 
um, stakeholders that have some expertise. H how is it that people would, um, those individuals engage with the district or have a seat at the table? I know, for example, um, some of our teachers and educators have been interested in like, how, how is the curriculum adoption going to occur? And will there be, you know, places at the table for um, stakeholders to be a part of that conversation going forward? I'll, I'll answer it at a high level. Rena, if you want to dive in with some details, feel free. And, and the, the high level answer is it's going to depend on the scope of the project. And that's uh, one of the reasons why we want to show, like we picked mechanical because it was easy. Um, as an example of you know, a timeline that's going to have some assessment, it's probably not going to have a lot of community engagement when we were looking at our mechanical system priorities. Uh, whereas our other scopes of work will. Uh, we're having conversations right now specifically about technology and curriculum. How does that development come to place? How do stakeholders get involved there? Uh, for a couple of reasons. One, that's that's uh, new to the bond. The, the, our capital program hasn't had those components before. Uh, but also, timeline-wise, those are a couple of scopes of work they're going to want to implement uh, quickly. Uh, so we're we're still developing those. Uh, I can say with a very high level of confidence, there will be opportunities to do that. Uh, in fact, I had conversations with, with PAT uh, here just in the last couple of weeks about how they can be involved even more uh, in processes around modernization. One thing I'll say that was nice about that conversation was I was able to give them some information about what we do now. They didn't know that. And you know, there's a lot of positive feedback of like, well, I didn't realize you did that. I'm like, well, we didn't do it you know, four years ago, you know, we started it two years ago. And so, um, again, I think, you know, that that's, you know, headed in, in a good direction. Um, so I think that's probably wrapping up my high level response of, it will depend, it will have to work through, and we are working through uh, those different scenarios. Um, Marina? I'm yeah, sure. I, I would just add, again, it's very specific to the scope of work. And so the type of community engagement that we're looking at for the ADA scope of work is going to be different than what we do for the modernization, right? So um, we have uh, some fairly um, standardized community engagement processes for modernization projects. Um, but as we start dealing with other scopes of work, it's going to look a little bit different. And so we're having those conversations right now um, we are specifically calling out community engagement in the bond execution plan, and we're trying to really think through what that can and should look like, um, understanding that it's not just within OSM, that this is a, a district conversation. And so we're having these conversations um, with, of course, our uh, community engagement uh, department, right, uh, as well as senior leadership and executive leadership, too. That's fantastic. Um, it's hard to get the whole community to come out for HVAC work, but it's really easy to get um, the community members engaged around, you know, more exciting topics. Um, I was going to say when they said the engagement for that would be a lot less, it's like, well, that's merciful. Yeah, well, it would be none. I mean, you could have the best pizza in that meeting and no one would show up. Um, oh, you might be surprised how excited people get about having warm or cold buildings that's that's true I, I was guessing with with that particular scope of work that you do you do hear from people when the systems fail especially um, teachers yeah um it's uncomfortable so um so that's great i'm really glad to hear that you're going to be kind of dynamic in your approach and i hope that um you know as we're as we come into this next conversation around the bond um accountability committee you know, this is another business case for diversifying that group because we have someone from the um, that knows Americans with Disabilities Compliance, knows universal design. We have members of other communities that we're touching. Um, it'll make for a really robust um, and productive group. Um, and so I hope we're very intentional. It sounds like you're thinking about um, the engagement and being very intentional with um, how you'll do that per project. Thank you. Um, so we're going to move on. We have about 20 minutes left and it's timing is perfect um, to talk about, have a discussion around um, the appointment of the new um, BAC members um, and the chair and the process to restructure the BAC reporting. Um, 
to better align with um, with this group and and just the business process. Yeah, thanks. Um, a couple topics about uh, the, the BAC. So we worked and do have an application, uh, B, the new member BAC application uh, live and available on our website. It's on the it's on the oversight bond accountability committee website. We can pour that out to anyone if, if they want it. Um, so that is that's live now. We are actively recruiting and accepting applicants. Uh, Timeline process wise, what we anticipate is at our committee meeting in December, uh, we'll we'll have the committee will have some discussion around the applicants, the new members, uh, and also the chair. Uh, that application is also an opportunity to uh, signify if you're interested in, in a chair position. Between now and then, uh, we'll we'll meet Michelle and and Marie and I will. We're planning on meeting and taking a look at the applicants that we have so we can properly form that discussion on the 10th. If we have 10 applicants versus 100 applicants, that conversation might need to look differently. But, but that's, what, um, that's what the intent is. And so to have a discussion on the 10th and then make a recommendation for appointments uh, at, the, at the full board. And I would encourage everybody to, you know, if they know somebody that might be a great fit for this uh, volunteer position, to to share the link with them um we want to be very intentional we, we would love the chair to be someone that works really well you know with dan and marina and um uh has the time to devote to this uh to, to this work um diverse applicants are are always welcome um and i think that we're we've had a discussion about you know what type of expertise um would be helpful. Um, I know with the audit committee, we used to have a requirement that you had auditing experience, but we removed that as a requirement because it's limiting for one, it reduces the the number of and diversity of people that you might get. And and people, regular people have great things to add to conversations that, that that'll be happening around that table. Can, can I just ask from a timing perspective, does, does the December 10th, committee meeting, leave, leave time to get that decision made about, particularly about a chair and, and board approval prior to the existing chair uh, leaving? Hmm. I believe that the existing chair, uh, I, I believe his term is up December 31st. Correct. Is that correct? Correct. Um, but he does stay on the BAC, correct? He does not. He will. He'll turn off the BAC. But he could. The term is only for the. The term limit is only for the chair. Isn't that correct? In the charter. The the, the charter has, has two terms. It's eight years for any member, and then uh, the chair term. I'm going to forget offhand. I I want to say it's three years. Um, and that's relatively new with the last change to the charter. Uh, the chair term. Oh, that was original for um. Committee member, eight years? Eight years, yeah. And has Mr. Spellman served eight years or is he just choosing to go off? It, he'll be eight years. He's, yeah, he and um, I think one other of our original committee members. Dick Steinberg? Uh, or, Dick is the original one. He's been with us a, a few years now. Uh, Tom Peterson is the other original member. So, yeah, I would just, I just want to make sure that that if we discuss it in committee on the 10th, we have time to make a decision, make a recommendation to the board and have a board um, uh, make a decision before it. I think there is just the one, uh, Dan and Marina, just one BAC meeting once we get this one rescheduled from, from yesterday. That That's the last BAC meeting of the year, is that right? That is correct. Okay, so we, we do, so there is, we just need to have a chair in place before that first meeting of, of the new year. I just, it feels like we're pushing it a little bit. Um, I don't know if there's a, if there's a better solution. I will also just say for the record, I don't think, I don't support term limits in general for elected officials. I don't support them on these types of committees either. I think this is the way we end up losing really good people with lots of knowledge who can actually see bonds from beginning to end. But I understand that is the existing policy. So that's a different conversation if we want to make that change going forward. I would actually support consideration of making that change. Um, so maybe that's something we can talk about at our next um, meeting. Are you talking about changing term limits? Because I feel quite differently about it. Um, 
Yes, I am. I think it would be worth having a conversation about that. Yeah, I do too. And I also, um, yes, I mean, we have good talent, but I think that if we are looking at diversifying our, our the people that contribute to decision making, and we we let people sit in a chair for you know 10 12 14 years that we're we're missing out there's an opportunity cost there that um you know allows doesn't allow us to bring in new thinking um new expertise develop a leadership pipeline um the city of portland i know just recently uh, a year ago let's say did an audit of all of it are the committees and some of the committee members had been um, in place for 27 years. And so when we're looking to, as a community, we're looking for different outcomes. We can't expect different outcomes with the same like set, you know, decision makers at the table. So I'm, I'm in favor of, of, of terming people off, thanking them for their service and appreciating that and opening up opportunities for people that don't look like, you know, a diversity of, 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 of expertise and lived experience. I would like to have that conversation because I don't I don't see those as mutually exclusive. We we've always I think had um, open seats on the BAC as we do now, and I don't know about the depth of our applicant pool now. Um, but I, I I agree with everything you just said, Michelle. But I don't see them as mutually exclusive. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think there's an end both there that that I, I I agree with you. If if our committees are not diverse and, and they're not diverse enough, so we need to figure out ways to diversify. Although there are open seats that we can be doing that with if if we're doing good outreach. But I think the term limits work against diversity as well. If you have a diverse uh, panel or committee, um, you're going to lose that talent as well. Um, you know, eight years in the future, which which again may may be a detriment to the district. So, well, I I like to think of us um, having this expansive like you know there's a lot of talent in Portland. It's not limited to the people around the table. And, you know, personally, I would just like to see, yeah, I would like to see a rotating cast of, of talent come in and, and, and help us get this work done. It's, it's, a personal, it's my own, my own um, opinion. Um, speaking of, speaking of talent, um, you know, we will likely have, um, we only have one position open on the audit committee and if we have more than one applicants um, some of those we may want to um, just given their interest in PPS and the audit committee if they you know aren't selected for the audit committee they may be also good members potentially for the BAC um, bringing a strong set of skills so maybe we can shift them over as well that's great <clears throat> um, okay, so the question, I, I don't know that we answered your question, um, Director Scott, about the timing. Uh, I, I don't know if there is an answer. It was just more of a generic concern. I just want to make sure that we have, I just want to make sure we're planning to have a, a fully functioning BAC in place um, by the end of the year, because given, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful the bond will pass, and I think it's just going to be really essential, so. And I think that we did a backwards mapping on this. So I think that when we did the math, that it, it did work out that we would have a chair in place by the end of the year. It will be tight. I think it's fair to and, say. It, and it will be tight, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Let's be honest. Um, so I don't know who wants to lead this discussion to process the restructuring of the reporting, the BAC reporting. Yeah, I'll do it. And I, and I think we can probably hit this one quickly, but again, I'll answer any questions is, so one of the uh, efforts uh, that is uh, underway and, and getting more underway is the effort to update the quarterly BAC documents. And so we meet every quarter, we, we provide them, uh, staff provides them with a set of standard documents. And it's kind of been on, on the list for a while to go through and update those. And certainly if there is a successful bond next month or next week, that's going to be even uh, more important to do that. So process-wise, uh, we've already had some uh, initial discussions. We're going to have more discussions here over the next couple of months of, towards the end of this year. Uh, draft some sample uh, updates to those materials. And then beginning of the year, as we welcome new members, we uh, potentially assume new scope of work, uh, have a new chair. Um, we will um, bring those members up to speed. We will update those documents and find oh, and, and we, we bring it up here because it really is a three-party discussion. It's staff, it's the BAC, 
but it's the board, you know, the BAC reports to the board, we work at the pleasure of the board. And so it's, it's you know, important that uh, we have the, those three parties. And that's why we wanted to bring it up here, just so the committee is, is familiar with what the schedule is. Is there any discussion around um, what Dan just shared? Or anything else for the good of the order? I'm I'm uh, I'm getting a reputation for er ending early. Um, I'd, I'd love to keep up. This would be the second in the streak. You're making me look really bad, Michelle, for this whole last year <laughs> we went over. But I appreciate your efficiency. I love it. Yeah, this is the second time in a row. Does is there anything um, else for the good of the order? And seeing none. I, I think we're, we're we're adjourned. All right. Thanks. Thanks, thanks for the meeting. Thanks our partners for joining us. Nice to thanks see you so much. Thanks for joining us. Bye guys.